well, we've got all these I.O. libraries, all these interfaces, all these storage devices. And you may be then wondering, how do I go about um, acting on this information, right? That's one of the things I always uh, like to think about. You, know, you learn, read some headline in the news, like, well, what do I do with this, this information? Well, what you do with it is um, you may need to enlist help, help of, from yourself or some other people. Of how, you know, what's going on? What, you know, um, why am I getting bad performance? How can I change my application uh, in order to, um, to get the performance I know is possible out of these storage systems? So you know, we, we saw the IO software stack, and, and there were some, there, there are quite a lot of tools for um, diagnostic and tracings and, de and debugging these things. But they often have um, certain characteristics that make it difficult to capture the IO at scale. Right? Either they sample um, and potentially drop the IO requests um, because they don't occur within, within, in, a, in such a way that a sampling approach will um, pick them up. Or they do a tracing-based approach, which creates so much data that there's no way of making sense of it all. But, uh, but uh, Phil Carnes at, at Argon and, and Rob designed and, and developed this uh, tool called Darshan, which has uh, been helpful to approach this problem in a scalable way and, and an insightful way. And it's in, in, in the years that it's been deployed on our machine and other machines, we've able, been able to come up with uh, some pretty uh, good stories about how applications were uh, misusing the storage system and how we could guide them into a, a better uh, result. So um, Yu Shu Yao and, and Katie Antipas from, from NERSC are responsible for a lot of this work. Um, Kevin Harms, Charles Bacon, Sam Lang, and, and Bill Alcock uh, were instrumental in, in an initial survey of applications we did on, on Intrepid uh, when we first deployed this to the whole uh, ALCF a few years back. So, um, you know, I mentioned there's a, a way of sampling, uh, sampling applications or tracing applications, but uh, we think of Darshan as a characterization tool for applications. And so, <clears throat> When we say uh, uh, characterization, uh, well, Darshan is, is a word for, uh, for a Sanskrit word for sight. So it's, it's sort of a way of, of looking into the application and seeing what's going on. Uh, we have the idea of um, uh, sequential I.O. where you know, each pro each, each, the axis, that the, the I.O. that happens is, is one offset after the other. Everything's getting bigger and bigger. Or maybe it's consecutive where uh, each block happens right after the next one. Or there's a regular stride as if you're reading out of a matrix. And so um, we can capture things like that. We can, we can collect um, cumulative results. It, it doesn't cost much more than an eight byte value to record the number of bytes moved, uh, the number of operations that were moved, that were, that were um, issued. Uh, generating histograms are also scalable because you can, you can then distill the 10,000 system calls that happen and, and then report them back with a, a table that's only a, a fixed uh, size, no matter how many or how, how many operations or how many processes were involved. So we use these kinds of um, counters and data structures to let us um, keep this tool deployed all the time. And we do this two ways. First, uh, we, we design it to be lightweight so that anybody using it um, won't no notice the results. It won't perturb the I.O. in any way. And then second, we trick, we trick users into using it. We, uh, you know, everyone compiles the application with MPI CC, so we, or, or MPI CCXX or MPI F90. We uh, inject ourselves into those wrappers so that people bring in or, or link in um, Darshan already uh, without knowing anything. We, we use PMPI, the profiling interface, to capture and count the MPI operations. We use linker tricks to wrap the system calls and, and count those. And so each process then can, can keep a table and, and records of, of how many operations and the size of those operations. And then MPI finalize, collect all that down using whatever efficient MPI collectives are available, and then write it out at, at finalized time. So here we, we stay out of our way as much as possible. We limit our memory. We limit the amount of uh, interference. And, and we're able to collect a, a good number of um, processes that way. Now, there are two limitations, right? We can't capture POSIX-only calls because we hook into MPI init and MPI finalize. And two, and this is actually a surprisingly common workload, if your model is just run until you run out of time, then we won't capture that either. Um, so people will do checkpoints every so often, and they'll ask for a day of time, and then every three hours they'll checkpoint, and then see how far they get. 
And I was surprised to hear that that's a common enough one. But we get, despite those limitations, we can get um, about a third to a half of all machine, of all processes that run on these, on NERSC and at Argon machines. This is a table of what uh, Darshan will tell you about an application. It'll tell you a bit about how much time was spent in the MPIO calls versus the POSIX calls. Um, I find this histogram of results to be helpful because I can see that most of the requests were pretty big, although there's a, some, some number of small requests we might want to look into a little bit. Um, you can look at the number of operations that were done at both the, the POSIX and, and MPIO level. Uh, often you'll see a, a lot of um, MPIO requests that get through two-phase boiled down to a small number of POSIX operations. And it can even tell you a little bit about uh, problems your application might have. For example, this odd number of bytes, 4,120, happens to be the size of the header. And even though there's 129 files, that header was read 512 times. So something in that application is doing multiple reads. Uh, here's a little bit bigger version of that, um, of the relevant graph pieces. Uh, and, and reading 4,000 bytes isn't a huge deal, but that class of error actually happens uh, more often than we thought. So once you have Darshan deployed, not only is it good for individual applications, but you can start to say things about the entire body of things that are running on a machine. And then you can go looking for problems proactively. Often an application will run and, and get bad I.O. and tell you, hey, I have a problem, how can you help me? But actually, most of the time, people are just worried about their science. And they say, well, OK, the I.O. is bad. It's just I, I can't do anything about it. I have enough to worry about as it is modeling the waveform equations or taking the Hamiltonian or, or whatever you're doing as a computational scientist. This database, this collection of activity can be mined. And, and then we can go out and, and help people get their science done even faster. So here's an example that was done on NERSC. So these, are all, um, these aren't uh, argon type workloads, but they're uh, these problems will happen sometimes on, on Argon machines. So how, we, how was, what's, one way, what's an easy way of telling if an application is reading more than it should? Well, if a file is X bytes and you're reading 5X data, clearly maybe something should be cached or, or recomputed. Um, reading a file multiple times is, is, is um, in the whole hierarchy of performance, reading is the last thing you want to do. You can compute a lot of data before it's more efficient to go out and read it again. So here's an example. We have... Um, Let's say your applications read more than a terabyte of data more than once. Uh, it turns out there were some hundreds of jobs that did, that did this. And the worst case was a run that was running for six hours. Every process spent about half an hour in I.O., but it turns out that this uh, 500 terabytes of data was coming out of this one terabyte data set. So uh, furthermore, eight kilobyte reads, very uh, inefficient reads. Um, this is a, a, a classic example where we could come in uh, uh, nicely, talk to this, this person, and, and suggest they try a different approach for their I.O. And they would probably be really happy to lose, uh, you know, get, get half of their I.O. time, sorry, half an hour of time back. So now instead of uh, six and a half hours of computation, they can, they can be, get, be doing six hours of computation and going to the next iteration. Here's an example, you know, as an aside, half an hour of I.O. out of a six and a half hour runtime means that they weren't spending that much time in I.O. So they wouldn't be worried about this right away. But as an administrator or a, um, the site consultants would see all these 8,000, um, 8 kilobyte reads, and that could interfere with other applications that are going. So here's a case where you can come in and, and fix this application, not just help this guy, but make the whole file system more responsive to everybody. All right, metadata. Things like open, close, um, seeking into the file, things like that. Um, well, if you're um, opening and closing files repeatedly, you're not going to get much science. You're not actually, you know, that's all overhead, basically. Even, you know, if you think, it's, applications often think of the writing part as overhead, but even, like, overhead on the overhead is the, is the metadata cost. Uh, so let's find some processes that are spending a lot of time in metadata, doing lots of metadata operations, and figure out if maybe they can um, write to a single file, talk to a database, do something else instead. And you, again, you find a couple hundred jobs that are, that are doing that. So here's a big job. In NERSC, for a NERSC job to be about 40,000 processes, that's, that's pretty big scale for them. Uh, and this job was spending half its time in, in I.O. operations, including metadata. 
And so it's generating hundreds of thousands of files, many, many write and stat calls. Um, here, here's a case where we can reorga reorganize their I.O. And, and now they can get half, you know, 50% performance um, benefit if they do a little bit more, uh, even a small modification to how they do their I.O. Uh, so the other example, another example here uh, in that same vein where small operations will um, hurt your performance and the, hurt the file system for everybody. Uh, take a shared file, which is good. We want to encourage that in, in many cases. Um, but then do lots of small writes to that file. Maybe you're doing independent I.O. or you're doing lots of index updates. Um, we can, with Darshan, see if you're using collective I.O. or independent I.O. So uh, we look for processes that are doing more than 100 million I.O. operations, and none of those are collective. And we find 230 jobs like that. So uh, the biggest offender here would be, um, again, about a third of the time spent in I.O., because it's issuing you know, six billion writes to the file system, and they're all 100 bytes. So um, one megabyte per second is nowhere near what these file systems can deliver even. Um, so so, so here, here's a good example. Very bad performance, lots of uh, almost a pathological workload. Um, it is, uh, there, are, there are several approaches. Maybe, maybe it doesn't lend itself well to collective I.O. Um, for, because things don't synchronize in the right way. But there are buffering approaches or cache management approaches that can mitigate these many tiny I.O. writes. And then, again, get you back to, you know, as Rob was talking to somebody in the, uh, at the break, these applications request time on these machines, but they don't request, that's the resource they request, CPU hours. They don't request storage resources or, or network bandwidth. So if you're spending a third of your time writing to storage, you're, you're wasting or paying a tax on uh, that, that app, that, those CPU hours that you wrote your big application to, to acquire. We also use Darshan to troubleshoot individual applications. <clears throat> Here's an example from a few years back where a combustion code was having a difficult time uh, getting enough performance as it does checkpoints, as it's doing um, checkpoint I.O. To, to GPFS. And uh, what, what you would um, you see from, the, from this bar chart here, where you're talking about I.O. costs as a percentage of time, this big blue metadata chunk is, is killing this application. Well, it, it's doing file per process. If you've ever done uh, access to a GPFS system, the, the time to open a file from many, many processes gets pretty bad pretty quickly. So we suggested some approaches to changing it. And, um, so we first we uh, can pre-create you can pre-create the files ahead of time from from one process before you submit the job that that helps a good bit, but if you use a uh, collective I/O approach, then you can do the alignment and, and the consolidation of requests and all those other benefits. And now um, I/O I/O meta, sorry the metadata is a very small portion of runtime, and the I/O part shows up as a percentage because it's actually moving data out to the file system. We'd expect to see some cost for this. Um, but now instead of doing 16,000 files, we're only dealing with eight files, a much more manageable number from the, for the sake of the file system, and, and getting much better performance as a result. Now, the other, that, that was a case where an application guy said, I am getting bad performance, and I think you can help me. Um, and he kind of had a, he said, so I had one mental model of what his application was doing and, and what the file system was capable of. I like talking about this example because uh, I won't embarrass Tom Paterka, my office mate, by mentioning his name, um, where he came to me asking for help and uh, swore up and down that he was doing everything I had taught him over the years about how to get good I.O., and yet he wasn't seeing the performance he was expecting. He, um, you know, as you add more processes, I.O. time scales up and, and, you know, knocks on the door. Rob, is this supposed to happen? Of course not, Tom. We'll figure out what's going on here. Um, so, Tom, let's look at the Darshan log and see what's going on. Um, and, and so he, this, is, this top view is what Tom expected. You know, I'm going to write out some data and then read it back. Uh, you know, dump out a little bit of data, um, read in some initial, some initial values, and then write out um, the answer, the, the tessellation or whatever he was working on. 
But instead, the, the reed region lasted quite a long time. Now, we don't know exactly what was going on here, but we know the first reed happened pretty early, and the last reed happened pretty late, um, and the first rite happened pretty early, and the last rite happened pretty late. Um, in here, the reeds and the rites overlap. And out of a, um, an application where that you were expecting to have very distinct reed phases and, and rite phases, that's a little bit of a surprise. But this is where that, um, that language interface happened. You know, uh, I know that in here is this, this data saving op optimization happening. And Tom's like, well, that, that, that's impossible. I, I am not writing data in an interleave, interleave fashion. Um, but then he went back and, and looked in and said, oh, yeah, I, I was. So uh, we, he, he did a little bit of different reordering, um, wrote out the index first and then the blocks, and now um, time is, is level and steady, and, it, and, and, it's, and he, can, he can then see better scaling as he improves, increases the number of processes, overall runtime. Again, and that's the answer we want here. We want to have um, time to solution, uh, more processes, faster time to solution, and, uh, and everyone's happy. The points in this tool is that at these scales of these systems, these three quarters of a million processes, these uh, several different I/O libraries that are in the way, um, we need something a little more sophisticated than um, than jump shot even or, or printf debugging or some other way of, of timing what's going on in these systems. We need a more of a, a more methodical, um, a little more sophisticated way of, of managing. Uh, the state of all these processes, and and we can do that, and, and it's a lot. It's a little bit lossy. I mean, you don't know exactly which processes wrote to which blocks of which file, but in the end, um, we've been find, we've found, we have found the, the Darshan data, the level of detail that Darshan captures, to be quite helpful in at least um, doing two things. One, the exchange we used to have with applications was like this: app guy would come over here, or app, app person would say, "Hi, I have a problem," and I'd say, "Well, let's." Uh, Tell me, some, some, tell me something about your application, what you're trying to do, uh, maybe try this or this. And then we'd go back and forth a few times, and then we'd finally get to the, the crux of the matter. Oh, yeah, you need to try these tuning parameters. But now, um, with Darshan around, the, the, the interaction is more like this. I'm having a problem. Here's the Darshan log. Um, why am I seeing this strange behavior, or why is this happening? And so it's reduced the number of iterations to, um, for us to figure out the problem. Uh, quite a bit. And then secondly, we get not just application answers, but because it's pervasive and always running, we can say something about we can say something about the whole ecosystem running on these system on these machines. <clears throat> Talk a bit about the workload that these machines are uh, servicing. And that'll help us know a little bit about what to deploy in the next machine after that. <clears throat>